the Good Neighbor Network, FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna, audio and video streaming at WGNSRadio.com. This is the WGNS Action Line, talking with Rutherford County newsmakers about what matters most to you. Now your host, Bart Walker. Well, good morning to you. Welcome into the Action Line from WGNS. This morning, we have Dr. Dan Rudd with us. Dan, good morning to you. Good morning, Bart. Good it's to be here. just like old times. I'll tell you. <laughs> good to have you No here. masks. <laughs> That's right. No yeah. masks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're so happy to have Dr. Rudd with us. And if you were in Murfreesboro during the COVID pandemic, Dr. Rudd is the one who was with us almost every day telling us what to do, what not to do, and sort of bringing us up to speed on what's happening around the world. We appreciate that very much looking back. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Has the COVID, uh, we hear things about COVID uh, ramping up again, doing some lighter things in the hospitals and things of that sort. Uh, What is the COVID story at this point? Well, Bart, I think that if you think back about our visits before, one of the things that I would always end with is do not be afraid. And I think that is still the thing to emphasize. Uh, We're having a summer surge of COVID, but we've learned so many things. It's, you know, we're at such a different place than we were in 2020, 2021. Uh, When COVID was new, uh, there was no, quote, herd immunity. Uh, We had not been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Nobody had any antibodies against it. Uh, compared to where we are now. We're at a totally different place. Um, The um, number of people in Tennessee who are dying daily from COVID is about four. Four, total of four. Four, Um, and that includes all age groups, counting people over 90, Um, and most of the people who are dying are severely immunocompromised or they're older people. you know, that's, it's a much different place than where we were. How does that compare to flu and things of that sort? Uh, it's a little more than flu, but it's still in that same range. Uh, but to give you um, another sort of uh, marker, uh, four a day is about, you know, 12, 1300 a year. Uh, right now in Tennessee, there are 3,800 deaths per year from overdoses so we're almost four times as many overdose deaths as COVID deaths and to kind of put it in perspective there what that tells us is we have a real problem with overdoses I mean you know fentanyl is is a very dangerous drug and compared you know in COVID it's still there will be deaths from COVID because it's a virus like flu <clears throat> that can cause problems. And the, if you're compromised, it's more serious. Um, but also today we have um, not only uh, sort of updated vaccines, which are, you know, are kind of questionable, but, but also we have antivirals. We have Paxlovid, and, which is a very good option for people who are compromised to take. It's something that, you know, it definitely helps to decrease hospitalizations and deaths uh, to take the antiviral. Do you think we'll have COVID with us for most of our adult lives? I mean, for most of the people I think today. it's here forever. Forever? I mean, for, okay. I, I, you know, whatever forever means, uh, it's, it's here for the long term. Uh, it's a virus that's endemic. But now, to give you an example of, we've really reached the point that we have attained herd immunity which what that means is that typically that's characterized as 70% of the population has antibodies against the virus. But we're actually at 95% of the population having antibodies for SARS-CoV-2, which equals what's called herd immunity. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't get sick. You know, we do. But what it means is it doesn't spread like it used to. You know, when there was no immunity, it spread very fast and it would go, you know, if you were in a car with somebody, everybody would get it. Or if you were at a meeting, everybody would get it. 
now because antibody levels are so wa- common, it, it doesn't spread like it used to. It, it, we don't, we're not nearly as likely to get infected with a, a, a low dose of virus. And, you know, we're going to see it. Obviously, we have a president who has uh, been uh, vaccinated six times. And he's gotten three COVID infections and has, in fact, got COVID now, which shows that, you know, you can continue to get COVID. We know that vaccines do not protect against getting infected with COVID. It's clear. Now, if you get COVID a few times, does that weaken your immune system and then you're more prone to have it again? It actually builds it up. Builds it up. Yeah. Oh, it's I mean, just the you know, we, you know, the problem you get as you get older <clears throat> or you're immunosuppressed is your immune system doesn't work as well. And so it's not as robust. It doesn't, you know, pop up and, and pop out the antibodies as quickly. And so you're more likely to have a problem with any kind of infectious disease or even cancer. Uh, you know, what as our immune system, uh, the importance of the immune system and immune system health becomes more recognized, we know that you know, things like vitamin D. You know, vitamin D is a very important chemical. And we need, that's something that really should be checked. And people should try to keep their vitamin D levels up and work with their doctor uh, to make sure that they're, they're in the zone they should be. Um, but I think that, you know, we're going to see less and less as far as hospitalizations and deaths from COVID than we've seen in the past. Um, You know, we live in an environment where the media and politics likes people to be afraid because it generates clicks and people listen to the news and everything more. It's like, you know, when there's a tornado warning, everybody listens to the weather. Well, there's a, a, quote, COVID warning, and now there's a summer surge, which sounds terrible. Um, but in reality, it, it's not that bad. It's definitely nothing, nothing to be afraid of. Uh, the FDA is still recommending, um, you know, the vaccines, the CDC is, the World Health Organization is. Um, and, you know, they will continue to come out with new uh adjustments to the vaccine as we see new variants. Uh, Right now, what we're seeing is the variant that is still from the Omicron line, which, you know, you've heard of Omicron for a couple of years now, but it's a a KB1, KB2, and an LM1 variant, which are the majority of the cases. But basically, it's still sensitive to the uh, the vaccines and it's still sensitive to the antiviral Paxlovid. So we're, we're in good shape with that. We have a text question here from a listener and they're saying that we remember back when we first started getting our shots, they were very careful to always give us the same manufacturer's uh, shot. Now it doesn't matter. They're mixing them all up. What changed the way they were doing things? I think initially, um, they wanted to try to track any problems that were associated with a particular manufacturer. And so, and also there were regions that you could only get one manufacturer. Like in this area, what we had was Moderna. And uh, that's what, I didn't really have a choice. When I got my vaccine and my booster, uh, that's all I could get. And so, but it also helped to uh, follow for any problems that were associated with any one manufacturer to allow people to stay with that one and see what, if any, problems existed. You know, the vaccines were initially uh, released under what's called uh, an emergency use authorization, an EUA, which uh, allowed it to be released without as much study as normally would be done. And, you know, and now, actually, we're still operating under EUAs for some of the newer uh, modifications of the vaccine, which, you know, it's like, I'm not really sure that uh, that's something that 
I don't understand why they're doing that, but I think it's just to allow rapid release of the modified uh, vaccines. Dr. Dan Rudd is our guest this morning. If you have a question, text it to us, 615-618-1450, 615-618-1450. Here's another question. This person is wondering about uh, the new uh, types of uh, infections and the new uh, medications for these infections. Uh, are there many new ones coming out, or are we still using the original four or five, however many of that was? Um I'm not following on that. I, th- I think they're wondering: uh, Are there some new vaccinations being developed now? Well, there's yes, there there are modif- modifications of the original COVID to fit the new variants that are found to be existing in the environment. And so, right now, the variants that are out there that are the variants of concern are what's called it's an Omicron virus subvariant called KB1, KB2, and LM1. And those are what they are producing the vaccine against specifically. And as far as effectiveness goes, uh, there's so many factors at play at the same time. One of the things is, is that you remember early on, they talked about herd immunity. That was the you know big thing. It kind of equated us with cows, you know, herds, and the there was no herd immunity because the virus had never been in the human population, and there was no antibody buildup in the population against SARS-CoV-2. Well, now when they test people, there's 95% of the people have antibodies, so herd immunity is defined at about 70 percent and above and we're at 95 so there is herd immunity for covid which really decreases the spread because basically people have antibodies now some have a lot some have a little and you'll always have infections that come up but the level the number of infections is dramatically lower than it was and I think that, you know, what we'll see is a persistence of that, just like influenza. Influenza, you know, we have vaccines that are produced every year based on what they project the, the flu antigens will be. Now, sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're closer. But overall, year to year, the flu vaccines are in the 50 to 60% effectiveness range so there will be flu is here every people will see flu and people will die from flu like they have for forever but flu vaccines are still recommended because they help to keep your underlying antibody numbers up and so I think that COVID will be the same way I see uh, this person here says I see so many people wearing masks all of a sudden uh do the mask work again or, or did they ever work in the first place why are so many people wearing masks again well I, I think it's a personal preference thing there's not a lot of evidence that that masks are that helpful now if somebody has a, an immune condition i i totally understand because you know they they don't want to have somebody coughing and spitting on them. And it makes sense. Uh, But there's not a real scientific reason the general public should wear masks. So do you think, uh, you're you're saying then, for most people, it it doesn't do anything. It's just basically an inconvenience. Right. And now, if they feel better doing it, fine. I mean, we certainly shouldn't chastise anybody who chooses to. I mean, because there are a lot of people out there who, you know, it's really hard for them to overcome illness. They, they are maybe weaker, uh, they're older, and if they feel that it's safer for themselves to do it, they should do it. But as far as a medical indication for it, there is no scientific evidence that it helps. 
does washing the mask on a regular basis is that important? I think I would throw it away. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. after you know three or four d- times days that you use it, I just throw it away and, and get another one. Because what is, is there still a, a recommended type of mask? Well, the N95 mask is is better than the just standard surgical mask, uh, but uh, there and there are plenty of them available. You can buy them online. You can buy them at the pharmacy. Um, so, you know, the, but the N95 is more effective than the regular surgical mask. And so you're saying the M95, if you're going to wear a mask, get the M95. N, like in, N, like in, in Nancy. Never. Yeah. Okay. N is in Nancy, 95. Okay. And, and, and after you wear it a few times, don't wash yeah, it. Yeah, dispose it. Away. Yeah, yeah. All righty. 615-893-1450 is our number, 615-893-1450. Dr. Dan Rudd is our guest this morning. We're talking about COVID, the changes in COVID, and we are seeing a slight spike, about three to four deaths per day in Tennessee, Okay, uh, which is certainly a whole lot less than before. We'll be right back. Broadcasting to every nook and cranny of Rutherford County's 618 square miles. FM 100.5, 101.9, and AM 1450. Hi, this is Peter Demas. One of the things that we've done years ago is we've been able to do our orders like our pastas and many other items that we used to be able to put them in large pans. And now we have a catering team that will even deliver it to your home. We can drop it off for you, set it up, or they can come in and pick it up. Look up our catering menu on www.demasrestaurants.com. This is Peter Demas at Demas's Restaurant, 1115 Northwest Broad Street in Murfreesboro. Hey, this is Dan with Music World and Drummer's Den. Come in for your guitars, keyboards, drums. We have lessons for anything with strings, uh, mandolin, guitar, bass, you name it. We have lessons for anything with keys at Music World and Drummer's Den, and a professional drum teacher as well. So if you need to learn to play something, we have you covered. Come on in, buy your instrument, start learning today at Music World and Drummer's Den, 2762 South Church Street, right across from the golf course. This is Pastor Nikki Ajapong, the lead pastor of Holy Hill Chapel in Murfreesboro on Northwest Broad Street. Hear our sermons on WGNS every Sunday night at 7.30. Our sermons are loaded with the keys of the kingdom. If you don't have the keys, you'll be stranded. Visit Holy Hill Chapel, tn.org, to hear our podcast. Our congregation is made up of a variety of nationalities, people from Africa, people from the Caribbean. We have people from Asia, Europe. Here in America, we have people who grew up in Murfreesboro, people who grew up in Chicago. When we had our international service this year, we had 24 nationalities. Everyday life, never take it for granted. You wake up, you get food to eat. You know, somebody doesn't have it. Don't take it for granted. You can learn more about us by visiting our website, holyhillchapeltn.org. Here's a question. What do you want from your electric co-op? An app for easy payment. Solar energy solutions. I just want to talk to a real person when I need help. Energy tips and low rates. Done, 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 done. I want to fly my car to the moon. Uh, Houston, let's talk about electric vehicles. Energy service life. That's Middle Tennessee Electric. We're here to get done what matters most to you. Learn more at mte.com. A few scattered showers and storms at times this afternoon with cloudy skies, a high in the mid-80s. Tonight, chance for storms, a low 70. Thursday, chance for storms, a high of 87. I'm meteorologist Jennifer Wojcicki on News Radio WGNS. Currently, it's 74. Hi, this is Gator with Tire World Off-Road. We're your local rough country dealer. So when you're ready to add some character to your rig, ask for Gator at Tire World Off-Road on Memorial Boulevard. This is Sean Brown at Tire World on Broad Street. Online at tireworld.us. Broadcasting from the tallest tower in the city with that little red light on top. FM 100.5, FM 101.9, and AM 1450.
Welcome back. Dr. Dan Rudd is our guest this morning. Our focus is on COVID, the COVID vaccination, and just uh, the status of the disease at this point. Good news that he shared with us just a moment ago. The number of deaths down dramatically. Uh, in fact, if we had had death counts like that back in the uh, 2019, 2020, uh, we would have thought the sun has come out and we're all ready to go, be back to normal. But it takes just a little while, I guess, just to get to that point. Well, it's it's been a rough ride. I mean, from the standpoint of the impact of the pandemic on so many people and and you know to me looking back on it the group that i think really has paid the price are school children because the, many of them have missed a couple of years of school it's affected their mental health it's affected their academic status it, it's it's impacted them in a way that it could take years or even their lifetime to overcome that if, if it happened to hit in the right ages where it, it slowed down their reading and math development, it's, it's very sad. I think it's affected the nation as far as trust in health care uh, specialists uh, because there have been so many conflicting and, and, and kind of strange uh, statements that have come out of national health leaders. Uh, I think it's affected the economy related to the national debt and how the spending and the shutdown of businesses. Uh, it's, it's affected politics. It's, I mean, it's really had a widespread impact that uh, probably will be interesting for historians to look back on and, and see really the way it was handled. It's really affected the work ethics, too. It has. I mean, so I've never people, seen... Th yeah. Nobody wants to work. Well, you know, uh, people were trained that they could be paid to stay home. And, uh, you know, that is a lesson that's really easy to get used to. And I think that it's impacted people. Uh, businesses. A, a lot of things. And uh, I think that, uh, you know... It's nice now that we're coming out of it, but it's going to take time to really recover from all the, the collateral damage that it's caused. How can we retrain the public to go back and get a job? I mean, you look now at people who are advertising for jobs wanted. It's everything imaginable from police departments to restaurants. You name it. They're yeah, out there. I know. And I think one of the things is, is that you know, inflation is very real, and their salaries have not kept up with inflation. And a lot of people, uh, they they work sort of under in the underground. They work for cash. You know, they can they can make more money just working for cash without being an obvious employee. And you know, and that that's coming out of this COVID pandemic. And, and what it's done to the country. So that might not ever change. It, I think, well, all things change. And, you know, and it'll come back, I believe, if we can get back on track as far as the way the country is run. And time will tell about that. You know, we've got this, uh, you know, the immigration crisis, which helped fuel the pandemic also. Uh, and now, even now, it's clear that the immigration crisis is responsible for uh, a lot of these uh, local isolates of infectious diseases, polio, dengue fever, That's malaria. Coming back. It, 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 we're seeing them in this country now wow. uh, due to this unbridled immigration crisis. And Tell us a little more. I, I had not heard that. I, and I was thinking especially with the work that the Rotary International had been doing to get rid of polio. I mean, eliminate it. And they right. were down to, I think, two countries. Right. Uh, so it's, it's not only back to those two countries, it's back in the United States. Yes. And, and what, the way they're able to tell that more than anything is through COVID, they develop mechanisms to do wastewater testing which basically shows the shedding of virus 
um, in wastewater. And there have been uh, uh, multiple cities now that have developed um, processes to test wastewater for different viruses. And it's used kind of as a canary in the mine to indicate presence of the virus, possibly even before clinical cases show up. And there, uh, there's a, a case of polio that has been identified in the New York area. And then they find it in wastewater also. Uh, dengue fever, which never was seen here. Uh, it was, is an, you know, it's a tropical disease. But now it's, it's present and there's an outbreak in Puerto Rico. There's an outbreak in uh, Florida. Uh, it's been found in Louisiana. Um, malaria, you know, which is gone in, from America. I mean, it's, it's, it's plagued uh, Africa forever, but we're seeing it here now. And, you know, measles. Uh, measles is one of those diseases that the vaccine is very effective for. And I think that COVID has caused a lot of vaccine hesitancy because the COVID vaccines have not been represented accurately and people don't trust what they're hearing from people who are really the experts in it. And we need a return of that trust because vaccines are truly one of the modern medical miracles. Uh, so many illnesses and so much childhood morbidity and mortality is related to diseases that are treated and stopped by vaccination. And, I, you know, I think that that's sad, too. Now, when you mentioned about some of these diseases like polio and measles, uh, we used to vaccinate against those as a routine thing. We but still we do. haven't done that, what, <coughs> in 20, 30 years? Yeah, well, the MMR, which is measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, is still used. So what about polio? Well, polio is something that I think that we're, there's, it's a complicated picture because polio vaccines, there's two different types. You know, polio is a virus that is an enteric virus. It, it infects the gut and it multiplies in the gut. You know, COVID is a respiratory virus. It gets in the upper respiratory tract and then multiplies in the lung. Uh, the vaccine for uh, polio, uh, the one that's been around a long time, affects the gut as opposed to attacking it when it's in the bloodstream. And, you know, and it, it, the complications are that the, the one that we've been, the vaccine we've been using still allows for this infection to occur at a, um, a level that is mainly enteric, which can cause the neurologic symptoms also rarely. And so, uh, you know, the new vaccine doesn't allow for any of it. So basically it stops the whole infection. It, it gets complicated medically pretty quickly, but a lot of the vaccines that have been used internationally are not like the ones we use in this country. The ones we use in this country are more expensive and it stops the infection totally. Now, for people who are concerned about those uh, are there vaccinations now that are yes, available? there are. But you have to specifically ask right, for them. Right, right. That's something that has to be specifically done. It's not part of the routine panel that children go through to go to school. Is this mainly for children? Because I remember yeah. children are the ones who got it, uh, and they got it. What Wasn't it through swimming and things of that sort? Well, it was thought to be due to swimming pools. But basically, it's an enteric virus that's transmitted like the bacteria E. coli is. Uh, you know, it's fecal oral. And so the, um, when you're vaccinated for polio as a kid, it is a lifelong thing. And so it's not something that needs periodic boosters. Um, you know, but, and, and we know now that one of the important things in immunology is not only the antibodies, but we have things called T cells, which are lymphocytes that are long lived uh, cells that stay in the body and stay there for really a lifetime to help 
bring back the immune reaction to infections that are not seen very commonly. Here's a, an interesting question from a listener. This lady said, uh, I am a mother and my daughter is in her 30s. She has children and she is afraid to get them vaccinations for some of the things that are coming along today. She did not have her children vaccinated against uh, the more recent uh, issues that uh, had come out about COVID. Uh, I'm really concerned because with with these other diseases coming back, I'm afraid she's going to do the same thing there. What can we do to get people to uh, to get these vaccinations? Well, we have to rebuild trust in the medical establishment because years ago when I would recommend to a patient a vaccine, uh, say a flu vaccine or a, a shingles vaccine, there was no question they followed my recommendation because I was giving them an honest opinion. Well, now there's so much on the internet and there's so much in real life experience related to the way the NIH and the CDC and the WHO have handled it with COVID. There's just a loss of trust. And until that's rebuilt, unfortunately, that the anti-vax movement uh, is is getting some legs again uh, to where it's it's up and moving again and then when you have a um, a person like uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. who is a total anti-vaxxer and believes that vaccines cause autism which it's been shown that it doesn't cause autism uh, you know but there's a voice out there and we ought to have I mean I'm for all for free speech I think free speech is what we have to have and speech that is wrong needs to be just we need to learn that there's speech that is inaccurate but unfortunately a lot of the inaccurate speech has been from our own government and so we've got to get back to honesty and trust and that's tough because all everything all vaccines can have potential side effects everyone and we know the covid mrna vaccines have side effects there there are things it can do to people that are not good but i think at the same time we have to recognize that you know we when is a vaccine needed and when is it not we know the vaccine saved lives for, with covid infections there's no doubt that there are a lot of people alive today because they got the covid vaccine that would not have been without it and because nobody had any immunity to that virus well now we know that you know the covid vaccine is still recommended but we have antivirals medications like paxlovid that are also very effective and in fact maybe even more effective than the vaccine and so you know it's hard to give the nuance of all of this to the general public because people don't trust Another question from a listener. This one says, weren't the COVID vaccinations originally created with a new approach to creating vaccines? And has that new knowledge helped them <coughs> develop better and newer vaccinations for other diseases, as well as improvements for the COVID vaccination? I think that they're referring to the mRNA vaccine, which mRNA is a platform that was developed actually around 2010 and it has been used in other vaccines. A COVID vaccine was not the first to employ that platform. And, the, you know, the mRNA is a newer way to vaccinate. Um, it's something that is very effective. But we have, with the COVID experience, we have so many millions of people that received it we're more likely to see problems with that because there's so many people that got it. And, and we did, we did see problems. I mean, we know that the spike protein, which is produced by the vaccine in the body is an inflammatory molecule. It's also what the immune system sees to attach to, to basically develop antibodies and responses against the virus. Uh, but we know that 
inflammatory things, clotting, um, myocarditis. I mean, there's a variety of things that have been associated with it. But the vaccine is also effective and, and it does work. Now, there are other vaccines out there that do not use the mRNA platform. The, one of the ones is produced by Novavax, called Novavax, and it is, it's more of a traditional vaccine. It employs um, a, an inert virus to carry the protein, uh, an adenovirus. And so <clears throat> it's more tra traditional. Um, does one work better than another? No, no, no sign it does. Okay. Our phone number is 615-893-1450. Dr. Dan Rudd is our guest this morning. We're revisiting the COVID illness, uh, and it's coming back, but you said not as viciously as it was. Uh, much, much less. And But you think it'll be with us forever? For, well, the uh, virus is here, and it'll mutate. There'll be uh, many variants that, that come out over time. And, it's, it's like most viral infections. A virus that causes an infection in any person mutates in their body, and multiple different changes are made in the body with the virus, and that person will release viruses that are, many of them, very different. Uh, not clinically important, but molecularly, they're very different. And so it's just what happens. It's what happens with flu. It happens with, uh, we know with HIV, we know it happens with COVID. So, and, and you're saying that this is happening again with polio and measles and things of that sort, although it's coming in from other countries who still have these diseases, they're coming in illegally through immigration. Uh, we're, we're still seeing it. It's alive, in other it words. It is. It is. And, it, and, you know, and we used to have, um, you know, better health inspections of people who were coming into the country and actually quarantined them, you know, until they were clear. Uh, to why help. do we not do that now? I wonder. That's above my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I would vote for it, but, you know. Uh, so it's, it's something that we... It definitely helps to cut down on infectious diseases that are brought into the country. We'll be back in just a moment. The final segment is coming up next. We're going to sort of review some of the things we talked about, because if there's one thing that we want to make certain is when this program is over today, you will have a, a new understanding of COVID. You'll have a new understanding of the importance of vaccinations. And maybe this can be the beginning of regaining that trust that Dr. Rudd says is so important. Stay with us. The Rick and Bubba Show weekdays from noon till 2. WGNS, your good neighbor station. Broadway County's place to talk. We're talking with Mary Ellen Evans. Why did you choose Adam's Place? Mostly uh, based on a realization that I wouldn't find anything more beautiful. The, the architecture is superb, elegant, and the people are caring. The residents, they consider it one family. I mean, this is just an, an unbelievable combination of good things. Hi, this is Terry Deal at Adam's Place. Call me for more information about Adam's Place. Phone 615-904-9111. Adam's Place. Schedule online, anytime. Getting an appointment with Ascension Care Teams at St. Thomas just got easier with online scheduling. Now you don't have to break away from your day to book the care you need when and where you need it. No matter where you are or what you're up to, whether you're a new patient or if you've been here before, just pick the appointment that works for you. Schedule online, anytime at getsthealthcare.com. We're excited to announce that Capstar Bank is now officially a division of Old National Bank. All those friends you've made while banking here over the years, well, they're still there. And so are the delicious, warm, homemade cookies. In Murfreesboro at 2230 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Everything you enjoyed at Capstar, still there at Old National Bank. Old National Bank, ready to serve you. 
Old National Bank. Member FDIC. Equal housing lender. Few scattered showers and storms at times this afternoon with cloudy skies, a high in the mid-80s. Tonight, chance for storms, a low 70. Thursday, chance for storms, a high of 87. I'm meteorologist Jennifer Wojcicki on News Radio WGNS. Currently, it's 74. A look at the news, views, politics, sports, and people that are shaping Rutherford County. Listen each weekday morning at 9 o'clock for the Roundtable here on News Radio WGNS. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Dan Rudd. And in a sales presentation, you, you hear people talk about, we've told you the facts, we've sort of discussed them a bit, and then we come back and wrap it up by telling you again to be sure you got it. And that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, so we're learning that the COVID vaccination uh, is working, and we're, we're down to you think we're down to about as low as we're going to get and it's the rest of it is just I suspect we're at a baseline that we can expect to stay in this region in this zone we're going to see uh, seasonal surges that's common with all respiratory viruses and I suspect that'll be the same with COVID ongoing for the next several years at least um, and we will uh, I don't think we can improve on our population antibody formation too much because we're at about 95 percent seropositivity now which is really good you mentioned that in tennessee we're seeing three to four deaths per day that's uh, correct is correct. are we seeing more in others are there some states that are worse than we are and some that are better it, well it's really more related to not just the state but the urban versus rural you know, the more rural you get, the less the deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, the more you get into centralized areas where you have a very high elderly population, a lot of closeness, you see more. But even in those areas, it's not as bad as it was. Now, there are people who did not get the vaccinations initially. Did those people get uh, the, uh, the follow-up vaccinations? Or are they still uh, unvaccinated? I think there's still a, a fair number of people who never vaccinated, but they got COVID and they survived or didn't. And if they didn't, they're out. And if they did, they're, they're here and they have antibodies. And we know that the infection itself creates antibodies that are superior to the vaccination. How is this working in other countries, in Europe and Asia, are, are they seeing well, the same thing? Everybody's kind of reaching a plateau like we are. And so there is a, uh, uh, you know, pretty much a herd immunity that has developed worldwide. Um, the uh, countries that lock down severely really are at the, about the same place that the countries that didn't. And so, you know, it's all leveling out. So is travel back to normal? Uh, well, unless you're flying Delta this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that has yeah. not, Delta nothing to do is with probably not normal, no. Yeah. no. Oh, boy. Yeah. They're having some rough yeah. times over yeah. there. So uh, we, we need to, you mentioned the thing that we need to do most is get our confidence uh, back in, in the people who are creating the vaccinations. And, and as a society, I think, and I hope that we will learn how to better handle pandemics. Pandemics will continue to occur. You know, how serious they are will vary. But typically, when you say you have a pandemic, what that means is that there is a virus that comes about that we don't have good herd immunity to. It's a new, antigenic virus and so we will have those i mean they we can't help it uh they've always occurred they you know how often they come varies but uh you know whether it's manufactured in a lab or whether it's a, a natural wild vi virus that emerges uh those things it could be either do you think this is the only pandemic we've seen in most of our lives uh, was was polio a pandemic? No, it, it really wasn't. I, we, the biggest one that 
probably the people, some of the people alive, were alive for was the um, what was the influenza called the Spanish flu and was it and, 1912? Uh, 19, yeah, 18, 17, uh, 18, 19 during uh, World War One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so, was a pandemic, and that killed and most a of lot us were of not aware of that. Yeah, I know. If for, I mean, most of us, nobody was alive then. Anyway, that's currently alive, but that was a, a very vicious pandemic because you know a lot of the troops that w- that were in World War One suffered from that and died from that. And in fact, you know, there were troop carriers going to Europe that when they got, they left America, everyone was alive. And when they got to Europe, everyone was dead on the carrier. Hmm. And so, I mean, it, it was vicious. Uh, it, it was really rough. I saw a, uh, a display, uh, sort of a, a historical display of of that uh, particular disease and uh, in a nearby Tennessee County. I was in the county where my grandparents uh, lived and I went and saw an exhibit there while we were going through this COVID that, uh, pandemic. And it was interesting how we approached it very similarly. Uh, the mask, I thought, wow, this, this is a long time ago and they were using masks. They even had a dog with a mask on so. Well, it, it was interesting because in, I read about that, and there was a town in Colorado that, in order to protect the town, they actually cut the road and the train line that went to the town. And they left it separated for about three years. And they all survived on their own for that period to keep the virus out of town. And so, uh, you know, it's something that. You know, fortunately today, uh, you know, we have other things we could do, like developing vaccines, developing other treatments, antivirals. Uh, you know, th- there's been a lot of things that have improved, so we don't have to isolate like they did. Now, let's not leave anything out. We have about a minute left now. Dr. Rudd, <laughs> are there any final thoughts that uh, you want to reemphasize or want to tell for the first time? Well, I think that. You know, people also need to know that vitamin D is very important. And when you see your doctor, always in your annual blood work, make sure you have a vitamin D level drawn. And you need to take vitamin D based on what that value is. Trying to remember to keep your vitamin D level optimally over 50, somewhere in the 50 to 70 range is great. Dr. Dan Rudd, our guest this morning here on WGNS. Some very important information. This program will, as in our other programs, uh, is in a podcast format, so you can go back and listen to it again and again to be sure you got everything that's needed. You can get that on our website, wgnsradio.com, or you can also get it on all of the other four major podcast sites in the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Dan Rudd, for visiting with us this morning here on WGNS. Hope you have a super rest of the day.